The Hornets suffer another bad loss to Milwaukee. Luckily, they don't face the Bucks again this year. We'll also discuss Steve Clifford's concerning comments about LaMelo Ball's injury and when he might be back, when he might not be back. We'll get to all of it today on Locked On Hornets. We're Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cuz, we live. We live. We live. We live. It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcast. And as always, that includes YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. There's Doug Branson. Catch his work, catch his write-ups on his website, everyhornetsboxscore.com. Uh, yeah, I got it. Great. I'm Walker Mail. You can listen to me on WFNZ every Well, no, let day. me try. Let me try. You can listen to Walker on uh, W-Y-S, uh, WFNZ. There you go. The letters are a lot harder than everyhornetsboxscore.com. That's, I wanted to say Substack, but the S's, they all got to me. So anyway, you can go catch him, everyhornetsboxscore.com, and you can catch us anywhere you get your pods talking about another Milwaukee Bucks loss. We'll get to how bad it was in a moment. They actually brought it back in the second half. It, maybe a fake comeback, if you will. Um, really, the, the big conversation here today, Doug, I think it surrounds LaMelo and okay. pre as Steve Clifford was taking questions before that contest against the Bucks, he was discussing LaMelo when he might be back. And I know you have the comment in front of you. So what were the concerning comments from Steve Clifford on LaMelo? Uh, he said, quote, it's hard to tell. This is when he was asked about, you know, timeline for LaMelo's return. He said, quote, it's hard to tell. He's doing the same stuff now he was doing two weeks ago. I don't know that stuff. He does what they allow him to do. There's a lot of factors in that. He wants to be back, just doesn't feel healthy enough, and people aren't comfortable enough that he should play, unquote. I think you really should go listen to – they usually put the pregame stuff on YouTube. If it's not on YouTube, go follow uh, Charlotte Hornets Reddit. They, they usually post that stuff too. Uh, but how he talks about it, I think, is – because I'm putting emphasis on words and I'm, I'm giving it inflection that maybe – you, you just got to go listen to him because I, I would best describe his tone there as cagey. It was a little cagey. Like, I don't, I don't want, I don't really know. I don't yeah. know that stuff. I don't know. What do you, what did you think about the, 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 no, I totally agree. But also does he really not know it? He's the head coach of the Charlotte Hornets. Like, how does he, how does he not know? So a couple things could go on here. One, if he doesn't know, that's weird. At the very least, it's weird that he doesn't know pretty much down to the detail on LaMelo's availability. And two, if he does know, which that's what I would guess, if he does know and he's still answering this way, telling you that he doesn't, then that's also not a good sign because <laughs> he probably doesn't agree with why LaMelo's out. Or or maybe that's not true, and I don't want to pin that to Steve. Maybe he doesn't agree. That could be true. But more so, Steve just doesn't want to ruffle any feathers based off of the decision that LaMelo and LaMelo's camp are making. And I, either one of those has to be the outcome here. Well, I would I, – I mean, maybe it's LaMelo. Maybe it's LaMelo's camp. But I would also put the organization in that pile yeah. of folks that are making this decision. Because, look, if the stuff – he says, I don't know that stuff. If the stuff that he's referencing is like sort of the inner workings of sports medicine – then, then, yeah, he's probably not an expert in, like, you know, managing soft tissue yeah. injuries or ankle injuries or all the hardware that LaMelo has in his ankle right now. He's going to cede some of that to the sports medicine staff, the training staff that's, that's uh, employed by the Charlotte Hornets. But he very much knows – if a guy looks good enough and shoot around to go, or if he doesn't, he's been around the league long enough. He's seen stars and not stars. And, and he knows like when a guy can go and when he can't. And he's also watched Brandon Miller this season go in some of these games when, you know, he wasn't necessary. He probably could have sat and he decided not to. So he knows that. And, and I believe that Clifford believes that LaMelo could have gone tonight I think he believes he could have gone a week ago, 
but he hasn't. And, and I think that LaMelo is about to be on a max contract. And this franchise doesn't want to take any chances on that. And that when when Clifford says there's a lot of factors in that, I, I think that's like the mitigating factor in this is that they just signed him to a max contract and they really want to make sure that if he goes out there, he's 100%. And look, the training staff, hey, they just hired a new head of basketball operations who's going to reevaluate reevaluate everything. If you're the training staff, Walker, do you want to take any chances at this point? Because if you say, if you give the go-ahead and say, yeah, Clifford, you can you can play LaMelo. We 100% sign off on this. And he goes out there and hurts his ankle again. Do you think yeah. you have a job anymore? Steve, right. And in that comment, Steve Clifford also said people. <laughs> it's very vague. There's a lot of things that could classify as people and what he's talking about. If he was mentioning training staff, then I think he would say training staff, right? Like, I think it would it would mean he's just medically not cleared to go right now. But he never said that. And I, I guess I haven't done the whole, hmm, let's match this comment with previous comments when we know LaMelo really couldn't go. And I'm sure that would be easy enough to do. I'm sure people could do that. But we just haven't done it. He said people aren't comfortable with him going. I forget what the exact word was, but you get the idea. Yeah, Very so vague. People aren't, comfortable. Right. people aren't comfortable enough that he should play. And, and so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it probably is his people. I think it probably is LaMelo saying, well, I'm not 100%, so what do you want me or to the do or, here? No, but you were right to point out the organization too, by the way. The owners, like you're, the you're, owners are on the hook right now point, for a max yeah. contract. These new owners are on the hook for a max contract that they're, that mm. if he injures his ankle severely again, they're not going to be able to get rid of. <laughs> I mean, so, that, it, it is a dangerous situation at this point. Point. It's and it's one of those things that doesn't people think that this has like a definite answer that like oh well you know that like if he shows up and does this and he can definitely go or if he can't do this and he can't go I think this is totally a situation where it's like well you look at the record like I think Clifford would be a little bit more explicit about some of the things going on here if the Hornets were like had a 500 record right now right if they were like in the hunt for something and they were taking their sweet time getting LaMelo back in the lineup, I think Clifford would be a little bit more annoyed. But I think he understands also that, hey, you know, this team is not exactly fighting for playoff positioning <laughs> or really in the play-ins at all. So, you know, that they're, they're, those are part of the factors that go into this. Although the answer post game about playing to win would counter that, but you are right. You you probably are going into the game with that understanding. I'm sure it feels like a mental wrestling match that he's putting on right now where, okay, I understand why LaMelo not be playing, but we're still playing to win. And so who knows if he's going to come back. It doesn't, I don't know. Th this is what I was worried about though, right? Because LaMelo and his ankles, not to his doing, but LaMelo's ankles, haven't earned the benefit of the doubt as to him coming back on the sooner portion when you compare sooner to later. Yeah. Just hasn't earned that benefit of the doubt. And so even if we hear some rumblings, rumors, I don't even know if outright reports we heard, but we may, I'm, I'm going to stick to rumors and rumblings, if you will, that LaMelo will return at some point post all-star break. And it felt like soon he doesn't play. Okay. Don't want to bring him back on the first night of a back-to-back. -back. Then he doesn't play against Golden State. Now here we are again where he's just not playing. He's getting out designations every single time, and we don't hear any rumors or rumblings that he is going to suit R up anytime soon. So, like, we just – he played 36 games last year. He's played 22 this year. I saw something that, like, he's played as Nothing. many games as Gordon Hayward over the past couple of years. That's, less. that's really setting people off. He, he's, he's played less. Than, than what Gordon had. I mean, I, I think that's true. Like, I, I don't know about the last two years, but Gordon's played 50. It, he would miss like half the season. LaMelo's missing more than half the season right now. And it's tough when that's your best player and he's not playing. It's tough. Well, and, and we can talk about that in, in reference to Clifford's comments after the game and this Bucks game because, I mean, these Bucks games, this Philly game that's coming up, although it gets a little better without Embiid, but, um, you know, some of these games against good teams, you understand – why you have to have LaMelo out there to compete in those games because it, the other defenses just can key in on, on the other guys. And, and what did Clifford say? We don't have any breakdown guys. Like LaMelo is a guy that right. you cannot – uh, you cannot allow to go 1v1 uh, over over the course of 48 minutes because he'll break you down off the dribble and cause all kinds of, of havoc where the Hornets don't really have those guys yet. Brandon Miller's going to become that guy, but uh, they don't have it yet. All I'll say 
is that I really hope that Steve Clifford is telling the truth in one particular aspect, and that's when he says LaMelo wants to be back. Yeah, I hope LaMelo no, right. is pushing to play every single time and somebody is holding him back, whether it's somebody from his camp, whether it's somebody from the training staff or the uh, the front office or the ownership group. I hope that people are holding him back and, and because – the, the biggest fear that I have right now is that all of these injuries, these ankle injuries, start to work their way up and, and get in his head. And, and that not the desire to play goes away. I don't think that that will go away, but that he, that he comes back and he plays a little bit scared. I mean, I think we – I hate to, hate to bring this name up in reference to this, but I, I feel like we got a little bit of that with MKG. Like I, I think the injuries over time wore on his confidence and his – his willingness to play in the way that he needed to play to succeed. And uh, so I really hope that that's, that's not what we're looking at here because the really, <laughs> I mean, the future of the franchise rests on him returning and, and getting back to an all-star level. And I want to be clear. I understand that portion of thinking. It's okay to be frustrated about the best player of your favorite team not playing and also understand that the organization has to protect LaMelo. We can, I've called it pretty simple over and over again. It's simple enough to the point where if the training staff and the organization says he's cleared to go, then go ahead and play him. But if not, then don't. And it's tough. It's trying patience of a lot of Hornets fans out there. And I get that. But I do understand it, and I do want to make that clear. It's still frustrating. And the other thing, if we're going with LaMelo and the lack of games and you know how much he's going out there, it's you know it, it does also suck that he doesn't get this kind of time with the foundation that you hope to move forward with. Oh, if you're going to bring if you're going to bring back Miles Bridges, then yeah, I would still I, I at least you have that foundation of chemistry there. But Brandon and LaMelo need to be playing a lot together. That's the thing. It's not even so much Miles. We can make it about other guys. Mark Williams actually included too. Um, but Brandon and Melo need to be playing a lot together. You would love to see it. Okay, let's uh, move on to the Bucks loss. I don't know how much of a tease that is. They're supposed to draw you back in to the next segment. But maybe we find some good stuff coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Never again. At least not this year. I don't want to see them play Milwaukee anymore. I know they brought it back in the second half. Um, it was kind Enough. of a fake comeback. Well, we'll we'll be done. We'll be done with the Bucks after this next segment. Stick around and find out what we have to say. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The wait is almost over, North Carolina. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, is coming to your state. On March 11th, like 11 days away, it's March 1st, you'll finally be able to bet on all of your favorite teams and all of your favorite sports. With FanDuel, there's tons of ways for you to get in on the action. You can bet on everything from the money line to over-unders to which team will win this year's tobacco road rivalry all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, with live betting, you can even pick which player will put up the next bucket and the one after that, so on and so forth. See for yourself why FanDuel is America's number one sports book. All you have to do is go to FanDuel.com slash locked on so you can be the first to know when FanDuel goes live in North Carolina. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel. 21 plus and present in North Carolina. If gambling is more than a game for you or a loved one, free help is available. Text more than a game to 53342. You can also call 877-718-5543 or visit more than a game.nc.gov. More locked on Hornets ahead. Doug, it'd be cool to not do that anymore. I'm glad that they don't have to. <laughs> That'd be great. Another loss sure. to Milwaukee. The Bucks sweep the Hornets four to nothing. They destroyed them. And at first, we were on first team ever to get beat by a team four times, 30 points every single game. That was on the table. Hornets battled back in the fourth quarter, really. In, in the second half, they limited Milwaukee to just 22 points in the third, 19 in the fourth. And so Milwaukee wasn't scoring nearly as much. And Charlotte was just treading water offensively enough to come back and make it somewhat of a respectable score. But it was bad. Um, if you want to focus on the positives, I think Brandon Miller played really well in the first half. Mm -hmm. I think that shot went real down in the second. Um, mm -hmm. There was a positive. Uh, I think they played very well defensively against Damian Lillard. Uh, I think even defensively in the second half, they got going. I know Steve Clifford said that they sleptwalked in the first. They weren't ready to play, and that's a big problem. 
and that was specifically on the defensive end. And he said that was different from what he had been seeing from this new group post deadline that they weren't ready to play defensively coming out of the gate. And so that was a part of the issue. But those were a couple of positives. Uh, Grant Williams was making shots last night, which is a good thing. He finished with 17 points off of the bench. Curry did as well, got to his spots. Mid-range was working for him too. Um, Ultimately, it's just like I was talking with Sam Purley last night, who also put a great piece uh, on on Michic, by the way, Hornets.com, like some really fun nuggets about Michic, who is a fun player. It's like if you play the Bucks 100 times, do the Hornets win five games? I, it's just the matchup's terrible. They're a really good basketball team. It's it's tough, and that's why they get destroyed every time they play. So I thought they competed harder on the defensive end as the game went on. They, right. they certainly, in that first game against the Bucks, Damian Lillard killed them in the pick and roll. Just absolutely annihilated them. The Hornets didn't know whether to drop and defend them you know, at the rim, or but then when they did that, you know, he would just pull up and, and go dame time and knock down deep threes. This is very difficult. So in this game, they said, all right, we're going to blitz you. We're going to double you. We're going to throw everything at you. Unfortunately, when you do that, you know, it's going to lead to a lot of open uh, corner threes. And Malik Beasley and some of these other role players were more than happy to knock those down. And so that's, look, that's the tough kind of gamble that you have to make against um, these good teams. And so to win those kind of games, what do you have to do? You have to score a lot. You know, you, when you play Golden State, when you play Milwaukee, when you play really good teams, you have to score. You have to keep up with them because you're not going to be able to totally take what they do offensively away from them. And that's where the Hornets struggled in this game. I think you're right. Brandon Miller was in attack mode in the first half. He was getting downhill. He had the great play against Lopez where he, like, pump face, gets him in the air, and then Lopez goes over the top. And Brandon Miller kind of sticks his booty out and gets that foul from Lopez. Just like veteran plays at the rim that I wasn't seeing from him early on this season. He's developing that part of his game. The mid-range is there. We know he can knock down threes, although he's, he's struggling with that a little bit now. But the stuff at the rim was just really good to see. And I agree with Curry, man. Every time Curry steps on the floor, he does good things. Like, every time. And and it's not just shooting, although that mid-range shot is money. When he hit that, like, step back over the taller guy, I think it was Gallinari or or Lopez. But he he really just got him shuffling the shoes and then, boom, knocked down the mid-range shot. Just love what I'm seeing from Curry. Uh, But this is tough, man, because – you know, offensively, it's a struggle because the Bucks did what Golden State did, which was, hey, we're going to get in your shirt up top. We're going to switch literally everything. And we can do that because, as I said in the first segment, what Clifford said, the Hornets don't have breakdown guys. It was Clifford's version of the we don't have any all-stars on this team quote yep. from Mitch Kupchak. We don't have guys that can break guys down off the dribble and make you pay for switching a big onto you. Again, Brandon's going to get to that point. He showcased a little bit of that in the first half. But, you know, when Bridges tries to do it, he turns the ball over. And and you really don't have anyone else with this. I thought the one guy that was doing it, strangely, was Grant Williams. (laughs) Like, I trusted him driving to the basket more than I did Bridges, which was A lot more space, right? I I agree with you. There's a lot more space. They cared more about making sure they got in the shirt of the ball handlers. And and to be honest, right, like Brandon Miller is is the guy that you trust – more because you think he can end up with a bucket out of it yeah. more so than some of these other guys. But even Brandon, I, I don't know how many turnovers he had. There was one bad one. There there were a couple of bad ones from Brandon in this game. Um, only one. There there was there was the one bad turnover, I guess, in the second half that I can think of. I think a basketball got poked away from him in the first. But you, you could really see Damian Lillard played well. I, you and I shared that same feeling, Doug. I think defensively he played well. Offensively, the Hornets played well against him, yeah. right? Like, I think, you know, what they did was they really limited Damian getting momentum. Like, everything Dame did, he had to work for on his 14 field goal right. attempts. They were very physical with him, and Dame was battling. But Dame defensively, which is he's not known for. In fact, he's known as a very minus defender. Not in this game. I thought he bought in. I thought he was physical, too. I thought he was, speaking of poking the basketball out, Like yeah. I thought he bought them some time on the back end. I was impressed with Dame defensively in this one. I was, too. I hope that Brandon Miller was taking mental notes because that's what superstars do. Damian Lillard knows that his role on most nights is to go and hit deep threes and use the pick and roll, get to the rim, score – you know, 25, 30 points a game. That's that's typically his role. But if teams are going to do what the Hornets did to him, then he's got to find other ways to punish that team. And that's exactly what he did. And so he turns up the defense. All right, you're going to take away my offense?
defense, I'm going to turn up the defense because I don't have to expend as much energy on offense anymore because I'm just going to get the ball out of my hands. That's what superstars do. They don't have to be superstars on both end of, ends of the floor every night, but they have the capability to do that. And and that is what I hope Brandon Miller is taking notes on, that you can impact the game. If they're going to take away from you offensively, then you turn it, you get more rebounds, you get more uh, defensive plays, you start to you know become a, a bit more of a playmaker. That's what superstars do. Um, not a great passing game from the Hornets here. Also not a great uh, shot making game anyway, because the offense has been pretty bad. Just final mo- final moments for me. Um, I thought this was speaking of a passing game. I thought Giannis had a couple of wowza passes, some just fireballs to the corner. There was the one that some of the accounts picked up on Twitter where it's the behind the back pass in the corner with Brandon Miller just too late to contest because of a relocation. But that was fun. But Giannis, you just what do you do? He, I think live, Pray. Doug. It, yeah, that's all you can do. I think I think Giannis, even if we can see it on TV, it's not like anything surprising I'm saying. But when you see Giannis live, it hits different compared to any other player. Like those are big dudes out there. In fact, Brandon Miller really tall at six eight six nine. It's interesting to see the size difference in person between Brandon Miller and Brooke Lopez, where Brooke Lopez does look so much bigger. It shows you just how much of a mountain of a man, a splash mountain of a man, if you will, he is. Yep. But also when Giannis is as tall as Brooke, that's when we go into a different level. Mm-hmm. And in person, seeing somebody like that, that can pass that well, hit a three mm-hmm. last night and you just can't do anything if he's under the rim. You can't do anything. Mm-hmm. And they found themselves in that position. Rihanna's at the rim, corner threes. That's the game. Bye. We'll yeah. see you next year. That's how they were able to destroy him once more. Well, and that allows Milwaukee's defenders to to stay up, you know, and, and take away those some of those driving kicks. You know, they were really focused and disciplined defensively in this game and the previous game. And, and it's going to be difficult for the Hornets. And when they get down 10 or 15 points – they know it, and they start to go into hero ball mode. And And I think Clifford had the, the great quote after the game where he said, we don't take bad shots, yep. we take okay shots. And yeah. those are the pull-ups that are open. You, you have an yeah. open pull-up, and, and I'll – I'm probably – you know, there there are other guys, but it's just Miles Bridges' pull-ups come up – to come in my mind first. And those are okay shots because they're open. But there was probably a better shot if you pump fake drive – pull the defense in, kick to the corner. And what what Clifford's point is, to beat a team like Milwaukee, you can't take okay shots. It, it, it's fine not to take bad shots, but you can't take okay shots either. You have to take great shots. And the Hornets didn't take those. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Bucks too, even specifically against Milwaukee, they're going – this is what they do. They actually defend the three well the last couple of years compared to what it used to be under Bud where they just gave up – open looks from three but they were not going to let you get to the rim now they're a little more balanced but they're getting they're allowing all the mid-range shots in the world which almost baits you especially if you're Brandon Miller who's effective but they're still going to live with the mid-range jumpers from Brandon if he gets there and so they're going to do that with any of these guys they they shot a decent amount like above average amount of mid-range jumpers in this one but also like long mid-range not even in the short mid so like it's yeah, at, it, that's that's tough. Corner threes and at the rim, and then we're trying to battle back because we have open shots and mid-range. Well, guess what? That's by design, and even if yeah. Brandon is good at it, okay, it doesn't matter. Like Even if you're good at it, you're still not going to be able to catch up with us. The, the two times that they were the most confident offensively in this game were at the beginning of the second quarter when it was Mann, Curry, Miller, Grant, and Richards because everybody was moving the ball. Uh, I mean, there was just movement, ball movement everywhere, and Curry was able to knock down – uh, five straight, you know, out of that second quarter uh, with that dirty dribble move. And then the other time was late in the game with Bertans because Bertans can hit tough shots. You know what I'm saying? Like if, you, if you're oh, yeah. not going to move the ball and you're going to take okay shots, you got to make them. And Bertans late was one of the few guys that were taking those tough shots and making them. I just wish he would kind of want him to get a little bit more run early in these games. I mean, I understand Clifford's thought process and like I want to start with good defense – but I'd love to see a little bit. I just want to sprinkle Bertans in. I just want a little dash of Bertans a little bit earlier in this game. And when he's, he's in, fun. when he's on the floor, let's get some let's get some plays for him. Like he he did play earlier in this game, but it's like he just he's just out there to sort of run and be a threat to shoot. I'd like to get a few more plays for Bertans going where he actually will shoot it. 
And, and and final thing for me, there's so many different things that are coming to mind, but like Milwaukee and Charlotte, they both shot a lot of corner threes. Milwaukee just hit a lot of corner threes mm-hmm. and Charlotte didn't. So that's another reason why you lose big. All right, let's go to the last segment coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Bobby March joined Wes and Walker, the esteemed Wes and Walker on sports radio, 92.7. <laughs> Can you say that? WFNG. I think I, I think I need this. If you're going to say esteemed Wes and Walker, I think I should be the Wes. one to say that. No, I need to compliment Wes. It's not. Oh, you you thought it was me. Oh no, I was saying it for Wes. I'm sorry. Well, let me let me try. Let me try. So you, on the on the esteemed on the esteemed Wes and Walker show on W F uh, Y L. That's right. Catch us there at ninety two six F A M. You can catch us there, and you can go hear Bobby Marks have that interview with us. Um, he spoke on Steve Clifford, whether he expects him back, lots of things, but we'll break down to Steve Clifford expectation coming up in the last segment. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a num- America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports, and it's just you against the numbers. You can pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections, and then you can watch the winnings roll in. It's demon time on Prize Picks, too. You can now win up to 100 times, 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 Demons and goblins are the newest and most exciting way to play at prize picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins get you different payouts, and you can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. Just four. Go to prizepicks.com slash NBA. Use code LOCKDOWNNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, prizepicks.com slash NBA. Use code NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. More Locked On Hornets ahead. All right, so, Doug, we also got, uh, before we get to the Bobby Marks comment on Steve Clifford, whether he'll be back, let's go to a Steve Clifford comment instead. And this one was post-game because the big story today is LaMelo Ball's health, and that was pre-game. But Steve Clifford also gave us, like, a fun Clifford rant that he is not shy to do at the podium. But it's been a little bit, I think. Like, he's been happy. He's been happy, Cliff, ever since he's gotten these new toys to work with post-deadline. And I still think he's happy. I, I think he wants to talk basketball, but I asked him about Brandon Miller last night playing 40 minutes. If I'm not mistaken, it's certainly in the top three, but it might be the second most amount of minutes he's played in regulation so far. He also had an overtime game against Boston where he played a lot, but the loss on February 7th to Toronto, he played like 41 and Brandon played 40 here. Steve Clifford said he was trying to play him a little less. And now that they could, because they have NBA players on their bench, but then he was like, well, look, you know, Steve or Brandon Miller gives us our best offensive chance. And he went on a fun rant about playing to a winning culture. And it was a long one, Doug. I know you enjoyed it as well. Uh, yeah, for sure. The esteemed Walker Mail asking this question. I heard Thank your you. I heard your deep baritone, and I was like, "Oh, I think Walker's asking this question." So I, I leaned in a little closer, and Clifford really. I don't know that he really totally answered your question. He used your question. I think he's studying from my. Uh, he's studying my game tape. He took your question and the then really Doug asked his own question, and then answered that question instead. Because when you're when you're answering your own question, you're always right. <laughs> It's, it's the brilliance of it. It is. Um, it is. But he. But what was interesting about it is that he was trying to explain that in team sports, if if you're not playing to win, meaning like you know end of the year uh, when you mathematically have a chance to be in the play in, if you're not operating like that, two things happen. It's going to be di- very difficult to go to your you know veterans and say. Um, all right, we're we're not going to play to win right now, but later on we'll play to win. Maybe next October, you know, we'll we'll start to play to win. You know, you you can't just turn that car off and then and then go inside for months and and come out and it's been cold and the battery's dead and all of a sudden you start the car and it goes row, 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 row. it doesn't want to start anymore. Same thing with team sports. You can't go to veterans and say, all right, we're going to stop winning, and and then expect them to get into that mindset. Again, um, so so I think that's what he's trying to explain there is that you've got to play uh, to you know it was his version of the play to win the game although it wasn't as emotional as as Herm Edwards, but it was essentially saying was like we we've got to play to win and so that means playing guys like Brandon Miller more minutes because 
he is. I mean, especially in a game where Miles Bridges played like he did uh, against Milwaukee in both of those Milwaukee games. Uh, you know, if Miles is playing better, if he's playing like a potential All Star, then there might be some room to play Brandon Miller 36, 35 minutes. You shave a few off and give a few more to to Grant Williams or to Curry or whatever. But that wasn't the case. I mean, Brandon was the offensive threat in this game. And so you had to play him, and you have to continue to play him as long as as they have a shot, um, you know, mathematically to stay in this thing. Yeah, so it's the third most amount, right? He played 39-39 last night. He played 41-23 against Toronto. He played 39-46 in an overtime game. And good, good. Boston. I think I think there was a – I don't know if I was accidentally watching the Bucks broadcast at one point because, you know, league pass, it always – every time I, yeah. you know, every time I fidget on the couch or eat a chip, it changes my broadcast stream anyway. <laughs> But they were saying, I don't know if it was the Hornets or the Bucks, but they were saying that uh, that Damian Lillard in his rookie season with Portland played the most minutes on the team. Because I, I'm sure that Portland team was bad. That's why they got Damian Lillard. But that's a rookie getting the most minutes. Like this wasn't, this used to be a thing. And Brandon Miller's a little bit of an older rookie too. It's not like he was like, you know, 18 years old coming into the league or 19 years old. He was a little bit older. And so like, yeah, good. I'm glad he's playing a lot of minutes. Fine. Oh, yeah. And, and it was just with Steve saying that because he does, Steve does think the rookie wall is real, even if Brandon Miller doesn't. And he's like, but look, I got to play him. He's our best offensive chance was the direct quote that he used in that answer that he had that was real long. And he's like, this is, we're playing to win. And this tonight was no different. You have other thoughts before we go to Bobby Mark? Well, he's also the guy that one of the only guys like holding everybody else accountable, saying, get back on defense. I mean, you know, you, you got to, if you want to establish a winning culture, you got to play the guys who actually like care about all of the things involved in winning. And, and Brandon Miller cares about every single one of the things that's involved in winning. So, so does Steve and specifically on the defensive end. And we'll see if he comes back next year. But it's been a conversation that. We've been starting to have more and more, Doug, and same thing happening on WFNZ. I asked Bobby Marks about that. Does he expect Steve Clifford to be back with the Charlotte Hornets because Jeff Peterson now as the new president of basketball operations does have familiarity with Steve Clifford when Clifford was a consultant there a couple of years ago? So these guys have worked together before. Does that mean Steve might be back? Here's what Bobby Marks had to say. I would expect so. I mean, I think Cliff's a heck of a coach. I, I really do. I mean, um, I, I think certainly what we've seen a little bit before the deadline, I mean, before the All-Star break and, and the games since, um, I know there's been some lopsided games um, in, in, the last, in the last couple of games here, but I'd love to see what Cliff can do with, with NBA talent. I mean, that, that's what, uh, you know, and I think he can do a lot of good things here. And I think it's just a matter of kind of what the vision of how long this is going to take. Um, is it going to be two years or three years? Um, maybe you get lucky in the lottery and maybe, you know, you're, you're where Oklahoma city was a, a couple of years ago and you're not that far away here. So, you know, because there is a relationship there, I think, um, I would, I would say that there, there, you know, I don't want to talk for Jeff, but I would think there was, there is a good chance that, you know, at least for the next year, you kind of, you know, you, you have that working relationship and you can see cliff with, um, you know, with a little bit of a different lineup. What are your takeaways from what Bobby had to say about Steve Clifford coming back? I mean, everybody loves Clifford. I mean, Everybody the media loves it. Clifford, but right. it doesn't mean anything. That That's all I would say. It's like, if, look, if Jeff Peterson, you know, g gets all of the stuff on the desk and then he, you know, starts to look at his options and goes, hey, there's another coach that I really like from this other place and I think he might be available. Like, would I be, like, shocked that they move on from Clifford? No, because there's nothing to – there's nothing sitting there in Clifford's resume with the Horn with this current version of the Hornets that would prevent them from making a move. Uh, but 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 I also see the reasoning behind keeping Clifford and saying, hey, you know, we, we've got him for one more year. If we choose to have him for one more year, we can have him. He has a great relationship with seemingly all of the players at this point. We haven't seen what he can do with LaMelo, this version of Brandon Miller, and all of the pieces. Let's just see what we can do next season. Because I don't think there's – there's not an expectation that this team is going to be even ready to compete for an actual playoff seed next season. You know, that it, it, that would be one thing. If there was some glimmer of hope that, like, oh, yeah, next season there's going to be a sixth or a fifth seed in play, then I say go find the coach that is going to be ready to coach that playoff team. But I, I don't see that happening, and so why not let the guy that – because the risk is if you go and move on from Clifford now, the risk is you bring in another guy, and that guy doesn't 
form great relationships. You got to start all over again, and then yeah. that guy doesn't form great relationships with the players, and you you lose a, a, another year. I mean, look what happened in Milwaukee with with Griffin. You don't want that to happen, so why not stick with that guy and and see what happens. And then if they underperform next season with some, again, reasonable amount of injuries, then it's easy. You move on. And also, I I think with Steve Clifford having good relationships with players, that's the thing people discuss with Jeff Peterson and his time in Brooklyn. And uh, remember, Steve had a good time in Brooklyn. At least it seemed like he was getting glowing reviews up there because, as you said, everybody loves Steve Clifford. And I think if we're going to encompass everybody, like Jeff Peterson is there as well. You know, I, if everybody loves Steve Clifford, then perhaps Jeff Peterson does too. Hell, Steve got fi- – even the guys that fired Steve Clifford hired him again. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you know you, that's when you know you're liked. So I, I think he's back. I think Jeff Peterson and Steve Clifford have a good relationship. I think they cared about those player relationships. And remember, it was the whole Jeff helped recruit – Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving to Brooklyn and Steve Clifford had a really good relationship with Kevin Durant. And like, I just look, maybe there's straw man arguments. That's fine. I'll be, I'll be accused of that. I just think things line up for Steve Clifford to be here. Uh, even with Jeff coming over here, having familiarity, if he's got such a high reputation, I would think Jeff has those same views as well. That'll do it for Locked On Hornets. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcast, including YouTube. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Remember, if you're listening over the weekend, hit the notification button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Where are our subscriptions right now, Doug? It's been a while since I checked them. Are they over 6,000? Is that uh, yeah, we, we have crossed the 6,000 threshold, 6,100. Um, Sweet. So, yeah, keep it, keep it coming. Subscribe, like the videos. That helps. Uh, give the five-star review on the – audio podcast feed even I, I know we have a lot of folks that that watch this show uh and and so i implore you if you're watching this show just to support the show go and subscribe on apple podcast spotify you know whatever app you have lying around that does audio only because that only helps support what we do here honestly mike ryan used to say this for the dan levitard show and so i'm going to steal this but what you can do is you can if you are a member of the sicko brigade okay mm-hmm. if you are a proud member then what we need you to do is go to the podcast feed, click unsubscribe, subscribe, <laughs> unsubscribe, subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe. That's what we need you That's to do. That's free. Yeah, you know, like it. you're getting yeah, the show for free every day. We're not just even asking for money. Just subscribe. Right. I mean, we're also asking for money, but we're not in this particular instance. That's right. We're not asking for money. That's right. So do all that over the weekend, and then we will thank you on Monday. Have a great weekend. We'll be back to recap Hornets basketball next time. 